Well, hello, everybody. It's wonderful to have you with us. I pray wherever you are that you know that God is with you exactly in the place where you are. Well, we have been in the Easter time. We, have, we are still in the Easter season. Jesus has risen and it changes everything. I want to talk today about how God appears to us and how he speaks to us and what he might say to all of us. What might he say to you, to me, to all of us here, to all of, our, all of us who are watching in all the places we are? And all I'm going to do today is read the scriptures. And I'm going to allow the scriptures to speak. And what I really would encourage all of us to do, everyone that's here, is to, is to listen in your heart, to everyone who's listening, to listen in your heart. And I pray in this Easter season that the Lord would speak to all of us. I'm going to read from John's Gospel. It's the morning of the resurrection. And Mary Magdalene, she goes down to the temple, uh, down to the tomb, and she says that, and she looks and she said, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, and one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not as yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Now, the reason I find this passage fascinating is because over the Easter period and having been through Lent, I have been really been on a period in my own life where I've been just really listening, really trying to listen to what God might want to say to me about the future. Many years ago, someone said to me, uh, uh, one of my mentors said to me, you know, one of the mistakes that we can make is that we can, is that we can live in the revelation of God of yesterday the things God said to us yesterday. We marry a certain person, we have a certain sort of job, we live in a certain sort of place, we spend our money in a certain way, and, and let's be honest, they're the very spiritual things of life, aren't they? When we get to heaven, they're the things that God is going to ask us about. He's going to ask us about our marriage, he's going to ask us about how we spend our time, he's going to ask us about our relationships, he's going to ask us about where we lived, he's going to ask us those things that often we just set aside and go, well, they're not, very, they're not the spiritual things of life, what they are is just the worldly things of life. But if you think about it, when you examine your conscience, what do you examine? You examine those very everyday things. That, uh, and, and, and I've been saying to the Lord, Lord, what are you saying? because we can always live in yesterday's revelation. But what I've learned is that who I am today is different than who I was a year ago. And my relationship with God is not the same as it was a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. Not only have I matured, not only have I got older as a human being, but my relationship with God has grown that we are not called to be stagnant or the same. And so as and, and, and so a question that the mature Christian must always be asking is, God, what are you saying to me now? What are you saying to me now? Not what are you saying to me in the, yesterday, but what are you saying to me now? Because the mistake many of us make is that we live in yesterday's word. We live in yesterday's revelation. We live in what God is calling, was calling us to do yesterday. When he has a today word, the Bible tells us, the scriptures tell us that God has something current for us, current for us. And so at there are various times, if I get to a chance for a few days uh, to be quiet, which I've just had in this last week, I often find myself saying to the Lord and I find myself writing in my prayer journal consistently, God, what are you saying? God, what are you saying? God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me now? Not what did you say to me a month ago, what did you say to me a year ago, but what are you saying to me now? 
And, 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 and what, what I'm effectively saying to God is, God, I want to hear you. In other words, what I want to have is a, different, is a new revelation of you. I want to have an encounter with you that's a now encounter. And here's the risen Jesus. And, and they go down there in the morning and they go to check on him. And Mary Magdalene goes there and she came in the dark and she finds that the tomb is open and she races back. And, and Peter, Peter and, uh, and, and John race down there. They race into the tomb and it's empty. And when they go in there, they hang around for a while and Mary Magdalene is there. And then it says that the men went home. In verse 10, which I didn't read, it says, then the disciples returned to their homes because Jesus was missing. But in verse 11, what did it say? Let's, Dave, can you take me back to verse 11, please? But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over. Why did Mary, the Magdalene, have this extra encounter with Jesus? I wonder if it's because she stayed. I wonder if it's because she persisted. She didn't leave. Maybe she had nowhere to go. Who knows? I don't know, but, I just, but it seems interesting that the, the men left... And she remained. And I've read some great things on women's spirituality that sometimes suggests that maybe the reason that God speaks so much to women at times and touches the lives of women so time is because women has a tendency to not be as active maybe at times and to have that deeper sense of listening. Because who was it right there at the end when, G when all the men had run away, that G when Jesus was being crucified? It was the women who were with Jesus at his death. And then John comes along and he says, John, this is your mother. But it was the women. And then here it's, it's the women that get to reveal that Jesus has risen. And she stays. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look. And she sees two angels and they say he's gone. And then she hears a voice from behind her. And she doesn't recognise, she doesn't recognise him. And she doesn't recognise him. And he says to her, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And she says, tell me where you've taken him, because if you've taken him away, I will take him and I will, I will look after him. And I, tell me where you've laid him, because I know he's dead. I saw him dead. So I will take him and I will lay him somewhere. Tell me where you have. And... And, 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 she, and, she, and, and it's only when she hears the word, if you can go to verse 16 for me, Dave, please. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and, uh, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. It was in the sound of her name. It was in the sound of her name that she recognised him. Like, like Jesus is about coming to us and he seeks intimacy with us. It's in our name. Our name is in many ways who we are. You know? Earlier today when we started, I looked at someone here whose name I know is Mary Ann and I said, Maria. I don't know why I said Maria. Maria's sitting up the other end. And, but it was jarring because why? Because it's not Mary Ann's name. And so Jesus, come, Jesus says, Mary, and immediately she recognises him. In other words, she had intimacy with him to be able to know that he was talking. Where would that intimacy have come from? That intimacy came from years of being with him, of listening to him, of being touched by him. Mary Magdalene, we often talk about as being a prostitute, but if you read the four Gospels, there's no reference to Mary Magdalene being a prostitute at all. Mary Magdalene was the one who had seven de demons exercised from her by Jesus. And here she is. What, what is it? It's, it's that. It's Mary. And as I've been away in this time since Easter, just having a quiet time of prayer and reflection, what I've really been listening for and what I've really wanted the most is to hear the Lord say, Bruce. That's what I really wanted. 
because it's the sound of our name. It's, it's, it speaks of an intimacy that comes from prayer. It speaks of an intimacy that comes from him. Hmm? After we went away for Easter, went with all the family, we did a whole pile of things. There was activities every day. All the grandchildren were there, and it was fantastic. It was one of we created memories that our family will live with for years to come. And it was interesting. Our children re- told stories of when they were children of holidays that they went to themselves. We made memories. And that we made memories, and it was, it was magnificent. And in the midst of the busyness of it, always when there was something happening, it was kind of hard to be still. You know, hard to be still in, in the midst of it. I mean, that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose was, let's all go away, let's have a great time. And we certainly did that in a fantastic way. But then in the last few days, I've just had this time where it's just been a bit quieter, and I've listened for God say my name. I just want to say to you, if you're listening to me, wherever you are around the world, whether you're listening here, in this Easter season, Jesus rose for us. He rose for us. He rose for you and me. And and if he saw us, if it was possible, you would hear his name. You would hear your name. You would hear your name. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for him. When, When, you know, there was a... There were, through history, there have been various heresies that have occurred. And there was a heresy that was around for quite a while, and it was this, is that, one, the effect of original sin, which original sin, was not so great that it damaged our relationship with God, that it was more, it was a, it was a flaw of our personality and of weakness, that we hadn't had enough example given to us. And so the heresy was, if you discipline yourself, if you keep the rules, if, you, if, if you're precise in the way you practice your faith, you will be saved. Well, the church came along and it condemned that out of, uh, out of hand, that that is not true, that, that original sin is not a sin per se that any of us have done, but it's a condition. It's like a disease. It's a condition where that makes us more open to sin. It's a flaw, it's a brokenness, it's a condition, the theologians call it, that makes us more open to it. And, and the effect of it is separation from God, and the effect of this separation is death, which means uh, being apart from God, you can't live in that sense and have the fullness of life. But it isn't our effort, it isn't how well we make the sign of the cross or how well we try to be good and, and not sin, or, or how kind we are to others. It, it, none of that saves us. What saved us was the action of Jesus on the cross when he was fully given by the Father and he fully gave himself. That, it's, you know, that, that it was purely on him that we can't respond in any way but because of what God has done. It was so complete. In my prayer time, every single day when I write in my prayer journal, I have the first sentence I write every day is, God, thank you that I can be here. Thank you that you make it possible because I can't do anything. A few centuries later, another heresy came along and this heresy was this. This heresy was this, is that, is that the reason, that if we were to be saved, then God do, does so much, but we have to make our effort. So God comes 80% of the way and we come 20% of the way and we're saved. And the church came out and it condemned that. It said, that's not true. You are only saved because of the 100% effort of God. And then we respond to God's 100% effort. It is not, oh, I'll I'll come 5% and God will come 95%. Because that's to suggest that we can save ourselves even a little bit, and we can't. That it is God's 100%, it's his total action that we are saved because what he's done, and then we respond. And that's our our, our response. Our work is in response to his 100% effort of what we've done. 
And, and, and so, so in this Easter season, a, a voice should be saying, Lord, I want to hear, I want to hear you, you say my name. I want to hear what you're asking of me. What are you wanting of me now? Not, not what you asked of me a month ago or five months ago or 10 years ago. But what are you saying to me now? And, and, and it was when, he, when she heard the name, she heard him. In verse 19, it goes on and it says, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. So this is the, this is the evening of the, of the day of resurrection. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he'd said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. So Jesus turns up into this locked room and he says to me, it's me. Look, I really am. <laughs> what, 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 what Mary Magdalene has told you is true. And, you know, Peter and John came and saw the tomb and saw that I was not there, but I'm here. Imagine what that would have been like. I remember a couple of years ago when my mother died and we're at the funeral home and uh, my brothers and I stood around and, and we had prayed and the family had asked me if I would lead them in a time of prayer. And they didn't know, not all of them are church attending, they didn't know quite what to do and so I led them in a time of prayer and they had the casket there and the, and the lid was off and mum was there and, and, and then my brothers were just left alone in the room. And, and, and I still remember us saying goodbye and then taking the lid and putting the lid and then screwing each screw down ourselves, each of us screwed a screw down, the lid of the coffin. That's what they'd done three days ago. They'd put him in their equivalent of a tomb. They had bandaged his body. They had tied the body with rope. Uh, they say, and uh, often in those times, it's so that the limbs didn't go stiff. And here, and here, here, all of a sudden, they get up in the morning. They think he's gone. So, in the, it, so it was completely natural. Where have you taken him? Where have you taken him? You, you know, I'll take him, and uh, where have you laid him? And I'll take him and lay him somewhere else. So all of a sudden. Here he is, they who had known he was dead in the tomb, and now he's standing in the room. And the first thing he says to you is, peace be with you. Now, often I think to myself, peace be with you would have been, you know, peace be with you, and that's just Jesus going, peace be with you. But I wonder if there was just such panic, he was saying, to be at peace, guys, to be at peace. You know, like how wild would that have been, hey? And, and here he is, and here he is with them, but there was one that was absent, Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. Look at verse 24. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. What's he saying is, yeah, okay, you know, you've had your encounter with him. You tell me this is true. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. What he needed to hear was Jesus to say to him, Thomas, Thomas. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And all, although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. 
And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. See, what Mary, what Thomas has in encounter with the Lord, and what do they hear? They hear their name. They hear their name. And I just want to say to you very simply is this. In this Easter season, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, seek him. Seek him in the quiet of your heart. Seek him diligently. Seek him personally. Find time to sit with him. I recently did a mission at a parish and someone wrote to me this week and said, the biggest thing I got out of the entire mission was I got one of your prayer journals where I write out my prayer. That is the biggest thing I got from the entire event because that time of prayer with my prayer journal is changing my life. I can't encourage you enough to find time every day to spend time with him and then to say to him, Lord, appear to me. Appear in my heart. Appear in my circumstances. Appear to me. Speak my name. Tell me what to do. Tell me what you're asking of me now. Not what you were asking three weeks ago or 10 years ago, but what are you saying to me now? Because God will turn up. God will listen to us. And God will be with us if we would listen. Easter is this time when we celebrate the fact of the outrageous love of God that he came 100% of the way. It's, one, it's, it's 100% on him. Years ago, and I think I've even, I could find probably recordings way back 25 years ago, where I used to say, well, well, it's all about you just do your best and God will do the rest. Even rhymes. So good, isn't it? You do your best and God will do the rest. I mean, it sounds so theologically correct until you discover it is completely, utterly and absolutely incorrect. It is all about the love of God, Easter. It is all about his 100% effort and our response to his purity, our response to his complete coming to us and saving us, that we bear no part in it, Apart for him, we can do that. And scripture says we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And when you come face to face with the mystery of that, you realise you need the Lord more deeply. And that's what this is about. And our work, the work, our work so much is to respond to what God has done. Because the truth is, I know that. But hang, talk to my family in the last few days of having spent time with them. I I've still fall down. I still mess up. I still do the wrong things. I'm still short, even though I know that. And so it is not my effort, but God's alone that does it. To all of our hosts who in all the countries where you are around the world, I want to wish you a very blessed Easter season. And I want to say to all of you that as you participate with us in all the countries where you are and all the places where you are, in touching the lives of so many people, many of whom you will never see or will never meet this side of heaven, you won't meet them or see them, and you won't know what, get, what is done, you won't know how far it goes, you won't know, you just won't know. And if I've learned anything, it's never to count the numbers, it's always to count the single person to count the one and to walk the miles for just one. The world doesn't tell us that. The world tells us that success is many. The world tells us that success is much, but it's not. The scriptures tell us that success is loving the one. And that's what all of you are doing. One by one, one by one, one by one, loving the one. We want to hold up uh, one of our hosts that many of you already know, Paolo. 
And Sandy, Paolo's mum, unexpectedly died two days ago. They don't know why, and they're working through that. And I know that many of you love them and are in relationship with them and have seen them, and I'd encourage you all as hosts to pray for them. And maybe you could reach out to Paolo at this time and Sandy and express your love to them as well. It matters, you know. It matters what you're doing. It matters what we're all doing. It matters what we do in our families. It matters what we do uh, to, to the few. And never buy into the trap or to the, to the worldly attitude that says many matters. It doesn't. The one matters. And, the, and if you add many ones together, it is many. And the reason our ministry goes to as far as it is is because I have learnt if you love the one and give the one their moment, that one will turn into many. I was in the church a little while ago, only a few weeks ago, doing a, an event, and at one of, the, one of the sessions, at the end of it, I stood down the front, and it ended, and the priest left, and the, all the uh, altar servers and those helping left, and someone tapped me on the shoulder. I was standing in the front row. I'd finished talking, and someone tapped me on the toilet, and I turned around, and before the priest even left, he goes, I need to talk to you. And, and I said, well, I said, well, let's just let them leave first and then we can talk. And this person came around and then, and then said, can you pray for me? And, 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 as, and I prayed for them. And then when I finished praying, there was someone else. And at this particular mass, I, um, uh, they lined their way. And it took me over an hour and a half to get out of the church because they lined their way all waiting to be prayed. I worked two steps and there was someone else there. Didn't happen at all the masses that happened at, at a couple of them. People need to have their moment with God. There were some people who came to me who had never been prayed with for their, in their whole life. And what they were looking for was to hear Jesus say their name. And some of them came to me and just looked at me and they didn't know what to say. And I just said to them, would you like me to pray for you? And they go, yeah, but I don't know what to do. We don't have to do anything. Just let's pray. People need their moment with God. And so my prayer for all of you as hosts, my prayer to everybody who's watching in all the places you are for all of us, is that we will have our moment and that we will be the carriers of Jesus in this resurrection time to people everywhere, that they would have their moment. Jesus wants to say, Mary, Thomas, Mark, Philip, Patricia, Michelle, he wants to say our name. He wants to say our name and he wants us to hear. Loving Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise because you are so abundantly good. And Lord God, we pray in this Easter season that we would hear your name. We would hear your voice ourselves. And Lord God, we pray that as we hear that, just as you said to the disciples, receive the Spirit, now go into the whole world. We know that that's what you're calling us to. In our families, in the suburbs we live, by the things we say and by the way we conduct ourselves. Lord God, bless us. And Father, we make this prayer in Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I know so many people who do not know the sound of Jesus' voice. They may have gone to church through their life. They may be someone who has never heard. And knowing the sound of Jesus' voice, it changes us. It transforms us. And hearing that voice is something that we hear in our heart, in our soul, in the depths of who we are. Our whole ministry is about reaching people. It's about reaching another person so that they would have that encounter with the Lord, so that they would know his voice themselves. Many people get told about God, but Jesus wants a relationship with them. And I can't do that. I can't do it by myself unless I go with others, others who help take this message to the, to the world. I want to thank all of our Faith Builder partners, the people who contribute, who've gone into our website, set up a way, and every month contribute towards us reaching more and more people and sharing the gospel with more and more people. To those who give from time to time, I want to say thank you to you. You are changing people's lives. And I want to ask you and encourage you, please, please help me. I can't do this. I cannot do this without your help. Uh, there are some people who will never hear the name of Jesus 
will never experience what it is to know his voice and his love unless we go. It, Jesus said it's for us to go and take the gospel out. I, I want to ask you, would you go to this address on the screen or go to the gift tab and would you help? On top of that, I want to tell you about an event that's coming very soon in the United States, in Chicago, for people across the United States, Canada and countries around, where people can come to uh, the Catholic Guy Mission event. It's the first time it's been held in the United States. It's in Chicago. And I'm so excited that so many people will be there and it will be just such a great time of blessing. You can go to this address to get the details, to register, to be part of the early bird part of it. I'm looking forward to you experiencing in a miraculous way the mighty power of the Lord. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there. Hey, God bless you. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for helping take the gospel further. Thank you for your prayers and your support. I look forward to seeing you next time. And don't forget, wherever you are, God is never, ever, ever far from you.